Today on episode 94, we welcome Malcolm Hawker. Malcolm is a thought leader in the field of master data management and data governance. He's consulted some of the largest businesses in the world on their enterprise information management strategies. Malcolm is a frequent public speaker on data and analytics best practices and cherishes the opportunity to share practical and actionable insights on how companies can achieve their strategic imperatives by improving their approach to data management. Malcolm, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Please just take a few minutes, give us kind of the story overview of your career and how your earlier experiences led up to doing what you do now. Oh, story and overview. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, it, it, it's it's a relatively long story, but I'll try to keep it fairly short. Uh, I did a 10-year career at this little internet startup called AOL. That was really like my first job out of graduate school. Believe it or not, I went to, to work uh, for AOL in 1995 answering tech support phone calls in a call center making $7 an, an hour. I was, I was troubleshooting Hayes modem connectivity where you, you try to you know help people understand, okay, are you connected? Are you not connected? Are things working? And, and, and with the intent of getting online and, and, and troubleshooting and maybe taking some billing questions and customer support questions. And uh, very quickly, I, I moved uh, from the call center in Jacksonville, Florida, up, up to the corporate headquarters uh, in, in suburban Virginia. Had a wonderful 10-year career with AOL through the rise of, of the internet. So mm. very much my DNA as, a, as an employee is, is, is around things like failing fast, is around things like experimentation and innovation and kind of forward thinking. And yes, I'm getting older these days and it's, it's showing in the streaks of gray hair, but very much that the kind of the time at AOL set me set me up. While I was there, um, I had the pleasure of, of doing a number of really cool things. I, I, I managed a number of engineering teams, even though I wasn't an engineer, which was really, really fun. At, at one point, I had a team of uh, 13 or 14 uh, Java engineers, and we were building out chunks of, uh, of AOL's advertising infrastructure that at the time was taking kind of like the insane amounts of transactions for, for the time. But I, I very quickly learned the kind of the art of, uh, of software engineering, not as an engineer, but as as a manager and the importance of data management through application development lens. Mm. I also had a number of jobs on kind of on the product side of the house. Uh, when I finished my tenure at AOL, I, I moved to Austin, Texas, and I, and I worked for a number of, uh, of companies, including Dun & Bradstreet. Uh, I worked for a, uh, a startup doing project management software. I, I felt like I had to put some time in doing, a, doing startup work. Uh, I was a consultant for a number of years, focused really kind of on, on, on data and data management. I, I felt a lot of needs there and, and I really kind of came into my own when I was I was hired by this 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 company based out of DC to, to, to what I thought was was answered like the simplest question in the world right and and the question I was hired to answer was how many customers do we have and at the time I was like man this is gonna be a slam dunk right I'll, 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 I'll run some BI I'll, you know I'll, I'll run a few reports and and get this figured out and and, and no problem and, and maybe I'll have to create a couple of data marts which is what we call them at the time or, or, or create you know some customized reports should be easy enough but I very, very quickly realized that for this large company that was highly decentralized and had de customer data all over the place, that my task was not going to be an easy one at, at mm. all. Um, and, and really, that kind of was my entryway, my, my gateway drug, as it were, <laughs> to, to data management, because I became enamored and fascinated with this idea that something so simple could be also concurrently so complex. And, and, and that meaning something as simple as how many customers do we have or products or assets or locations do we have? These things seem like infinitely simple questions to answer. But for large companies, we're incredibly perplexing. And, and that just drew me in. And I'm like, okay, I got to figure this stuff out and I got to help companies figure this stuff out. So really that was my, my entryway into MDM uh, for this company. We, we, we tried a few different things early on. We tried to kind of build some custom interfaces in Salesforce, which was the CRM. We tried to do some things from a reporting perspective, no matter what we did, all the kind of the bad data got carried through into those systems. We weren't addressing any, any of the underlying governance issues. We didn't invest in governance. So in many ways, I, I learned the wrong way in, in some in some instances, or, or the less effective way, I should say, um, of of doing MDM and doing data management and implementing a governance program, uh, but those lessons really kind of carried forward through the rest of my career and subsequent positions again at Dun and Bradstreet, uh, and now with Prophecy, um, where where 
I just I just love the complexity and the simplicity of of of, of MDM and I and, and it's really kind of like my life's work now to try to help companies figure this out whether we're talking about MDM or whether we're talking more broadly about data management as a whole I think there's a lot of lessons that can be carried from one to the other um, you know, that did lead to a, a beautiful amazing three year run nearly three year run at Gartner uh, where I was a data analytics analyst at, at Gartner I, I co-authored. Uh, three MDM magic quadrants and, and, and a bunch of other research uh, in the data space, not just MDM, but a few other areas as well. So um, I, I'm in a unique position of having seen what works both as a practitioner um, and an analyst and a consultant and a software vendor. So I've worn every hat. <laughs> and and you've you've been on the call center helping people with with internet issues before oh internet was a thing people understood well they may not still understand it but but i just i i can't believe like i didn't know that about you first off and we've known each other for a while but like i did not know that and i'm like finally i've met a person on the other end of that phone call cuz that must you there must be some stories from that oh. and like just how difficult at that time cuz i mean there's some people on that are watching this or listening to this that Think of AOL as like a dinosaur company. AOL was the company in the mid to late 90s about oh, yeah. anything with Internet and technology everywhere. I mean, the CDs in the mail and all this stuff like people they you don't even remember how big AOL was. But they they were like the TikTok of their day. It was oh. amazing. Yeah, Ab absolutely. They were the TikTok of their day and the Facebook of their day and the Google of their day because yeah, they, yeah, they were absolutely. the search engine for the Internet. Uh, at the time. So, no, when I was in the call center, my gosh, this was 1995. So, you know, a, a reasonable modem speed at that time was like 28.8K yeah. baud modem, right? Where, oh, I, I was uh, answering tech support calls and, you know, it's like people call up and say, well, I, you know, my cup holder's broken. I got that one. And, and the cup holder was, was the disk tray. Right, the CD-ROM <laughs> disc tray that would open up and be, like it, the, the cup holder's broken. Oh, you mean I put that little thing in that in my cup holder? Meaning the the little thing was the disc that that AOL was carpet bombing the planet with at the time, mm. which were the the, the, inst the install discs. Oh, you mean I put that thing in my cup holder? I I had that one with, without a doubt. I, I I had that one. Um, I had the I had the one where okay, I got the disc and I got a computer and. Now I'm ready to get online. And they'd call me and, I, and I'd say, okay, well, do you have a modem? And they'd be like, what do you mean? What's a modem? Oh, I, I heard that too. Because at the time, know, yeah. modems were yeah. a peripheral, right? They were a separate thing that you plugged into mm -hmm. your computer. Mm -hmm. So you you name it, uh, I've heard it. But yeah, at the time, AOL, for, for the vast majority of Americans, was the internet. Um, because, mm -hmm. it, you know, at the time, you know, the, the fledgling internet was, I mean, there were very, very few applications that were written specifically for the internet. There was Gopher, there was Waze, there was a few other things that allowed file transfer. There was a few things that allowed messaging, really basic messaging. But in terms of like viewing of content or like of reading an online newspaper or magazine, yeah, what was it? Because it was, it was the only thing that was, you know, that had kind of consumer grade applications that were riding the internet. Yeah, uh, it brings me back. This is like I didn't, I did not, I didn't not expect this to be part of the the conversation today. But so the the question <laughs> I want to ask you before we get, because I I feel there's a lot of parallels in my own experience, different storylines, different places, and and the kind of thing. But I I feel like I've navigated around a bunch of different things, and then ultimately ended up in the place doing the things I was always meant to do. Right? right. And and it seems like you've kind of figured that out similarly along the way. Like you knew data management, you got introduced to, you started doing yeah. research, you did consulting, like you've been everywhere. You've worn, you've worn all these hats, but in, in my mind, you, you have all of these, you, you've unveiled the facets of a jewel, like of, of what your life's work is about. And, and I really get the sense and, and having talked to you previously, and, and I'm sure the people, uh, the audience out there, you know, they get the sense like you are doing what you are always meant to have been doing like that, that it's been calling to you throughout your career. Is that a fair I statement? I think so. And <laughs> and I think the proof is in the pudding. Mm -hmm. If you get a chance to meet with me or watch any of my videos online or watch me in a meeting, like I'm really passionate about this stuff. Mm -hmm. Like maybe like disproportionately so like maybe like maybe this guy needs to chill a little bit passionate about it. But I really honestly am because 
after all of this, after my time at Gartner, after my time at the trenches, after my time of managing engineers, you know, it, it sounds crazy to say this because I, I can't believe it's coming out of my mouth, but 30 years, yes, 30, 30 years of, of being kind of, in, at least in this space, we're very, very adjacent to this space. I <laughs> feel like I know what works and I know what doesn't work. And I've seen it work and I've seen it fail. I've been the, on the end of the failures. So mm -hmm. I, I really want to help people avoid that stuff. I want to help CDOs succeed. I want to help VPs of data and analytics succeed. I want to extend the tenures of, of, of CDOs. So yes, I'm, I'm in the right place. I feel like it's the right time. Mm -hmm. You're in the right place in the right time. Um, I, I didn't honestly, until the last three years with, with Gartner, it, this really kind of solidified a Gartner, but I didn't realize until then the, the kind of the, for lack of a better word, the evangelical angle here that actually does appeal to me as well. I, I didn't think yeah. that it would, right? Because I've never considered myself a salesperson, right? Like I, I just like mm -hmm. sales is like this, you know, that's somebody else's job. But on the contrary, I, I actually am quite passionate about selling the value of good data management, selling the, 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 the value of a CDO, selling the value of data quality, and in a way that is, is meaningful to the business, right? Because I was the guy that was trying to sell an MDM program through better data. Mm -hmm. I was the guy that was trying to sell an enterprise information management strategy through capabilities and through features, and that didn't work. And it didn't work as, as well as it could. But this notion of doing it through the lens of business enablement, right? Of selling more, reducing your costs and reducing your risk. These are things that I'm learning as I go. And that lo and behold, I'm actually quite um, happy to be doing through through mediums like this and podcasts and, and, and other mediums. So yes, I, I it took me a while, um, but but all the roads seem to lead to here. And it doesn't doesn't on the surface sound like, you know, being a tech support rep for a, you know, an internet company. Uh, it doesn't sound like that's the, you know, uh, you know, going to lead you to where you want to get to, but I always remained open to opportunities. I always remained mm -hmm. open and I always listened and I always feel like the number one thing that has been guiding me the, the, the most is if there was one thing, um, is this passion for problem solving. And, and, and I think I could probably, I could probably make that work in other fields, but in the in the data field, I don't know. There's something special there, and and again, I think it has to do with this paradox of what appears simple but is really not. Like that twist to me, there, there's something challenging there that makes me just want to bite in and not let go. There, there's a couple of threads that I want to pull on here because it's that notion of of it seems simple, but it but it definitely isn't. And and I want to I think I want to come back to that because I think that one will carry us for a while. But I'm curious uh, because I I would tend to agree with it. I've long said I'm I'm not a huge fan of of sales jobs. Like I don't get fundamentally motivated by the money. I don't get, but I, but I like the problem solving. And I think the connection to problem solving that you've drawn is is exactly right. Like I think that's exactly what what it is. Um. But I think if you're a, if you're a change agent, if you're if, if a person that is trying to do something in a business that isn't happening already, you got to get at least somewhat comfortable with sales. Like the, the, that is a fundamental part. The, the currency is different. If you're asking for something internal, you're not asking for a statement of work or a check exactly, but you're asking for some sort of support. You're asking for some sort of resources. It is not a huge departure from a traditional sales role. So if you are a change agent, becoming somewhat familiar with sales and, and comfortable with sales is an essential part of, of your job. I'm curious, though. On this journey that you've been on, because clearly you're you're passionate about this. Clearly, this kind of um, podcast and stuff is, is part of your job as, as an evangelist, as, as and clearly passionate about MDM and 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 data management topics. At what point in that journey did you realize that becoming a speaker, or thought leader, or content creator, author, or however you you think about it in your own mind? Um, when did you insert that into your career and realize this is going to be an important part of who I am and what I do in this data space that I'm in? I, I can tell you, I can tell you the galvanizing moment. There was one, hmm. and and this may sound trite, and it, and it may sound nah, I don't believe it, but but literally there was one, and which makes for a better story. <laughs> but it also happens to be true, which makes it actually even for a better story. That's right. Uh, I was working for Dun and Bradstreet. I was, my title was Distinguished Architect. 
And I traveled the world with the Data Whisperer, Mr. Scott Taylor, and we were going around to DNB clients and DNB prospects talking about the transformative nature of data. Hmm. And that was good. And that was awesome. And if you ever get the opportunity to travel the world with Scott Taylor, I say, take it. <laughs> It'll be a good time if you ever, if you can. Um, but that, but that, but that aside, you know, I was speaking, I was speaking probably two or three times a week with multiple companies and I was having, you know, really meaningful conversations with, with data leaders and with business leaders. But the, the audience at the time was relatively small, meaning I would go and meet with maybe five or maybe 10 people with the company A, and then I would go do it again with company B, and I'd go do it with company C. And I had a few um, conference speaking sessions as well that were pretty cool, but, but it, was, it was really kind of siloed, for lack of a, of, of a better description. And when I was with DMB, we were sponsoring a Gartner event. And it was at one of the data and analytics summits that was still happening. It was in Orlando. It hadn't actually transitioned over to, to Dallas, Fort Worth. So we were in Orlando. I, I can't remember which. And, and, and it was the kind of the keynote speak, speaker speech. It was the morning of, of day one. And the, the conference chair was a gentleman named Michael Moran, who was an mm. MDM analyst at, at, at Gartner. And, and who just so happened to live in the same town that I was living in and, and had been living in previously, uh, Austin, Texas. And, mm. and, and Michael gets up on the stage and, and I listened to him speak and I listened to him talk about, you know, the Data and Analytics Summit. And I, I listened to, to, to him, you know, opening the event. And I said to myself, I could do that job. And it would excite me to do that job. And I think that I have value to add to that position. Right. Not not that I could just do it. I, I actually said to myself, I think I could add value to the people here and I could do it in a way that was significantly uh, kind of a force multiplier against what I had been doing previously in my other position. And it was at that moment that I was like, aha, I, I need the kind of the it's not that I need. It's just that if I had a bigger stage, more people could actually benefit and I could I could have a more meaningful impact on the industry that I was becoming to care about immensely. Mm -hmm. So after that event, I actually reached out to, to, to Michael. We, he had previously worked at Dell. I had a bunch of friends that worked at Dell. If you live in Austin, Texas, you, it's like one degree of separation to Dell. There's always somebody that you know that knows somebody else that had worked at Dell. Uh, in this case, it was a gentleman named uh, uh, Jason Simmons, who one of my one of my ex peers at, at, at Dun and Bradstreet. And I said, "Hey, could you give me Michael Moran's email address?" Yeah, here you go. Reached out to Michael Moran and said, "Hey, Michael, I'm, I'm I'll be blunt. I want your job." Um, <laughs> this is kind of that's kind of how I am. I, I just like to throw it out there. I don't want to beat around the bush. And it's so funny because he just said, uh, "It so happens that I just resigned my position, and, and, and I, I'm on leave for a couple of weeks while we kind of sort out my affairs and transition to transition away from Gartner into my next position." Which he ended up going to work for the chief. Of, he was becoming the chief of staff for the COO at SAP. Sat down with Michael and said, "I want your job." He introduced me to a bunch of people, and then the kind of that's it. I, I I got in with Gartner, and I ended up I ended up taking Michael's job. But that's that's the answer to the question, which is when did I know, uh, and when did I know that kind of the evangelism angle here would be important to me? It, it was sitting in a Gartner event and, and figuring, yeah, I could do that. That is a cool story. That is I, I that I love the the moment type of story when you know yeah. all of a sudden something that's been probably in the back of your head for a while all of a sudden comes right to the front and says hey you remember me yeah. i'm i'm here now and and that's yeah. that's a really cool thing that you were able to actually achieve that um it's those kinds of stories are are i love those mysteries they they're, they're just odd little things that uh that happen throughout your career these odd moments that um you know, some somehow makes sense in the end. Uh, so that's that's really cool. Indeed. So let's get back to the, the the topic of data itself. And so, you know, as we think about master data, the the customers, employees, like the things that should be easy but aren't, as you've been talking about. Mm -hmm. How how are we going to fix this? Like, I, I feel like I've been oh, doing gosh. this for a long time, too. And it's like we're not considerably closer to these simple things. We've got all this power now. We can do AI stuff, machine learning stuff. Everything's, you know, supercharged. But yet we can't still somehow manage some of these things that should be simple. What's the answer going to be? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know. 
but but I will I will I will fight through my to my last breath to try to make it right and to try to figure it out. But this yeah. is a good dovetail into the why did I leave Gartner conversation? Because mm-hmm. for people who do what I did, I mean, you could you could argue that I kind of you know hit the pinnacle, right, in terms of. Mm-hmm. Being a trusted resource for best practices around data management, data management strategy, you name it. I, I mean, Gartner is a pretty good place to be if you want to be seen as somebody who knows some stuff. Um, so, so I was in a pretty good spot. Um, but what I found, Anthony, was I was having a lot of the same conversation over and over again. And that in and of itself is not bad. But what I found was that I was having the same conversation with the same company over and over and over. And almost always that conversation came back to focus on outcomes, quantify your outcomes, build a business case, understand the connection between data and business. You got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do this. And companies weren't doing it. And I had to take a kind of a hard step back. And, and, And the same is true, by the way, it's not just MDM and building an MDM business case. It's around a data quality business case. It's around understanding the connection between data management as a whole, right? As, as a practice, as a discipline, as a program, and how you're impacting business outcomes. And so it's not just, this isn't just about MDM. It, this is happening everywhere. It's about governance. Um, yeah. when, when I was there, one of, one of my peers at Gartner, Saul Judah, published a, a, a note at Gartner saying, the state of governance is worse than you think. <laughs> and I could quote numbers in there that, that, that are like, just go like, as long as my arm that, that kind of quote where there's lots and lots and lots of opportunity to improve. So mm-hmm. I had to take a kind of a hard step back and say to myself, okay, why, right? Why, if we, if we know these things work and it, and it's not just pointy headed people like me saying, you need to do this cause I'm smart. We had data, we had research that said things like when you focus on governance, when you focus on outcomes, when you have a well-articulated data strategy, good things happen, Mm -hmm. right? And and we can quantify when those, all sorts of data that that say, you know, data leaders need to take, you know, more of a structured approach here and need to put some rigor in governance and need to put some rigor in MDM. So we had lots of data to back it up, but over and over and over again in my conversations, it wasn't happening. So I think, there's a lot of reasons why, uh, you know, I think, I think a lot of it has to do with incentives, plain and simple, right? Um, that, that IT leaders are incented in a different way than business leaders are incented. And if IT leaders had had kind of P&L responsibility potentially, uh, but then a lot of IT leaders wouldn't take those jobs, right? So, so it's, it's a bit of a catch-22, but I think it has a lot to do with incentives. I think it has a lot to do with a, 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 a number of things, but I'm, I'm committed to trying to make things right and one of the reasons why I left Gartner is because I think that as a thought leader, we need to be accessing um, all channels. We need to be using not just published white papers and not just one-on-one phone conversations and not just conferences, but podcasts, but LinkedIn, Smoke Signal, Carrier Pigeon, I, 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 Blimps is something I said when I was having a conversation with Scott a couple of weeks ago. It's like, I don't know, right, how we get those messages out there, but those messages need to get out there and in a way that is relevant to to, to data leaders. So, you know, I, I see LinkedIn as a really, really increasingly powerful platform for sharing this. I know you think the same way and others think the same way. But however the message needs to get there, I'm, I'm committed to, to trying across multiple channels, across multiple medias to get the message out there because we know it works. So I don't have all the magic answers just yet. Um, I'm trying to figure things out. I, I do think that incentives have, have a lot to do with it. I think that organizational structures have a lot to do with it. I think that competencies uh, you know, and backgrounds and experiences of, of IT leaders have a lot to do with it. I mm-hmm. am optimistic that the role of the CDO will help break through um, some of these things. This is one of the reasons why I'm, I'm focused on supporting CDOs uh, mm-hmm. is because I, I have a lot of optimism there. Um, you know, we, we know that 25, upwards of 25% of CDOs now have actual P&L responsibility for digital transformation. Um, so if you're on the line to deliver business results, you're more likely to actually track those business results and, the, and, and you know, how you got there through data. So I'm optimistic. I'm absolutely optimistic and I'm passionate about solving for it. But I think the answers here are fairly complex. But, but yeah, we, there's still a lot of challenges out there. 
You know, so Malcolm and I, before we uh, started recording the podcast, we were ch- we were chatting about uh, uh, an event we were at uh, weeks ago uh, around CDOs in, in, in Boston. And, and we had, we saw each other there and we were chatting there. And we both noted that that group, a lot of CDOs at this event, was a uniquely good event and for having these kind of deeper conversations. And I start to wonder, and I'm like, Malcolm, you've been all over the place in your career. I've been all over the place in my career. Is that the career trajectory like is that our our career path for a cdo is have all the jobs and then you can have enough understanding to be a cdo with all of these multifaceted responsibilities and pnl responsibilities that are that tie to the business in ways that technologists like to your point often don't connect to at that depth is that what we're missing is that like is that part of it i think it's impossible to have all the jobs (laughs) <laughs> um, <laughs> you could try. It feels um, that way. <laughs> I mean, I think it's a, it, but, but I, I think if if I had to pick between a business leader and a technology leader to 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 lead a data analytics function, to drive a data strategy, to build a governance organization, I'd give a fifty one forty nine edge to, to to the business side. Maybe maybe mm-hmm. fifty five forty five <laughs> to, to the mm-hmm. business side. That said. One of the common themes that, that I don't know if you heard this when we were in Boston, but I certainly heard it in a number of presentations was, and this was really, really refreshing. I, I took this very, very positively. What I heard a lot of the CDOs there say over and over again was be humble, be humble, acknowledge where we have failed to drive business benefit in the past, acknowledge where we haven't really listened very well to business requirements, acknowledge that that there's a lot more work that we need to do and be humble there right don't go in with the answers go in with questions right and i heard this as oh, a recurring yeah. theme and i found that really refreshing because i think in the it world we really put a premium on being the smartest person in the room and already having the answers because we get paid for that right we we, we get paid to have the answers we get paid to figure out how to you know to solve for the rubik's cube and it's not necessarily in our nature to have other people um, tell us how to solve for things as IT leaders. We are the ones to help solve for those things. So often what I've experienced in, in my past, I don't know if this is the same with everybody, but we're often, you know, technologists kind of tend to lead with answers, right? And, and, they, and they tend to lead with solutions. They lead with capabilities. They lead with features and functions. And as, a, as you know, an outcome of that is, is a disconnect. Right with with mm-hmm. with the business. So, um, I I know I, I love the this notion of being humble because to me it's like okay how do we collaborate? How do we figure out where you're coming from? How do you figure out where they're coming from? How do we bring it all together? And you know again there there are some CDOs out there that are that are that are high functioning that are doing an unbelievable job, which is another nice angle of that conference in Boston, which was we don't hear nearly enough about the success stories, but we did in Boston. That was that was pretty yeah. cool. So. So yeah, I, I think I think it's 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 a bit of a unicorn skill set. There's no doubt about that, right? CDO, the right CDO is is certainly a bit of a unicorn, right? It's 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 half sales, half business, and half technology. <laughs> and yes, that equals yeah. that, that's three halves. But that's kind of yeah. what we're going for here. So it, it it's tough, but the but there are people out there that do it. I really like that the be humble, that kind of sense of curiosity, that recognition that you don't have all the answers. If you try to lead with the answers first, you are going to be a bottleneck and you are going to be wrong. It's yeah. just like you, the businesses move too much, the data is changing too much, the systems are changing too much. I I would say that, like you said, there's kind of three groupings of fifty percent. Like I I definitely think you need to understand technology and business uh, to be effective as a CDO um, and be an effective change agent, which we, which we mentioned as, as uh, that sales component to it. And I just think about the trajectory of my own career where I've had roles as a CDO, I've done consulting a lot. And I actually not, you know, a couple of years ago took a, a job back in the industry side because I got tired of just talking. I got tired of just saying, hey, do this and watching client after client, yeah. not being able to see it all the way through and not being able to be part of that with them because 
the contract would end or they needed different skills or what have you. And, and really what it comes back to in these kinds of CDO roles or any kind of data leadership role is somehow being able to merge the influence and that communication, getting the message out, being that enthusiast about the things that need to happen broadly in the organization, but also having some of that builder mentality too. Cause, cause just words is not going to solve data problems because there needs to be technology to kind of harness it all. The power is too great to just hold in your hand and say, here's yep. data, data, data. You you need technology tools. You need platforms. You need secure. You need all of these things that make data work in our organizations. And you need somebody who can lead the charge of building those things on top of just talking about the value of those things. And, and you need it all. And it really isn't an easily defined skill set because the nature of data is – horizontal through the organization we want data from everywhere and we want to be able to use it everywhere and we want that to be okay and accepted and, and supported and our organizations are very vertical in their in their organizational structures and i think that's necessary like it's not like our organizations don't work we make stuff we're good at it you know but there's challenges when it comes to data or other horizontal functions that this isn't the first time we've had problems or challenges. Like anybody have challenges with recruiting with their HR organization, trying to find the right people. How do you screen the right people? How do you get the right skill sets? How do you even know how to interview people with very specialized skill sets? These are very tricky questions and they, we've put a lot of effort towards it in the HR world, but I think that data can learn some things from HR and how they structure their organizations and also recognizing one thing that I've been thinking about lately, too, is how many organizations have put nearly as much effort or energy into data as they have to their people. And I'm not saying they should. I'm just saying if they're parallel in their complexity, the amount of effort to solve them may be complementary or, or, or comparable as well. Yeah, um, totally and completely agree. Uh one story I, I, I tell coming out of that that, that CDO conference in uh, in Boston was uh, I was at a, a presentation by uh, Joe Caserta, who, who's ex consultant, mm -hmm. su super smart guy, and he was talking about data literacy. And I asked him a question that I thought was just like a mic drop, right? I I, I said, you know, if data leaders were more business literate would we be asking business leaders to be more data literate? Like I thought, I thought that was like checkmate, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Because, because I, I, I tend to have a little bit of a problem with the phrase data literacy, because I think it's condescending, right? Because the, yeah. the, the, the flip yeah. side of that is, is, is illiteracy, but this does tie back to kind of your notion to investments in data uh, and getting people familiar with it. And then, then, then as a response, uh, there was, I had this really this brilliant aha moment uh, and, and where Joe said, okay, well, th you know, think of it this way, uh, you know, and he used the metaphor of a thermostat. Like he goes, if you walk outside right now and you look at your phone and you look at the thermostat in your phone, you're going to know the difference between hot and cold. You inherently know how it works. You, you, you've got, you, you know, the, you know what each of the markings means on your thermostat. And maybe if you thought about data literacy that way, that would be enough. Right. And I was like, aha, there. Right. And, and I, I, I may be kind of making this bigger than it really, really was. But like that is how we, you, me and other pundits in this space help our clients, um, our industry, our fellow data leaders get over this hump of why are we not being as effective as we can? Because if you could, if, if somebody could, at least for me, in my mind, in like two sentences, take data literacy and make it actionable and put a boundary around it and, and make it insightful and, and describe it in a way that would be infinitely actionable by a business leader, that's what we need. We need, we need more of that. And um, it, it's, I, 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 I learned this when I was traveling the world with Scott Taylor, because he will tell you over and over and over again, he's not a technologist, he's not a technologist, he's not a technologist, he's never actually even managed a data organization, but the words he uses and the way that he communicates those words, maybe it's with a finger puppet, maybe it's with a children's story, I, I, I don't know, but they're actionable and insightful and they're meaningful and they're digestible. 
right? Like that's what we as data leaders need to do more of, whether we're talking about data literacy, which in theory I get, by the way, like I, I get it, but let's stop using data literacy. Let's stop, you know, it, it being, you know, technology first, right? This is, this is my first, this is my biggest gripe about data fabrics and data mesh is like, who cares? <laughs> Right. Like, let's not talk about the architecture. Let's talk about the business needs first. And maybe a mesh or a fabric would align to that. But maybe it doesn't. But I can guarantee you that your chief revenue officer doesn't care about data mesh or data fabric. Right. Let's have a conversation about cross sell or upsell or other business outcomes. So I think how we communicate and the words that we use are can can be incredibly powerful. And I, and I think that if we start doing things more along, you know, the, the lines of what I was talking about before, actionable, digestible, meaningful in, in ways that don't really necessarily involve complex technological subjects, we'll be much farther ahead. Yeah, completely agree. I mean, this is why in, in the work that I've done with data leadership is I always connect it to data value. And, and I define data value as this differential in outcomes, business outcomes, real outcomes that are measurable based on all this stuff that we're doing. And, and, and my strength and weakness is that I oversimplify for effect. Like that's what I do. I, I make the analogy. I tell the thing that somebody can understand, but it's way simpler than reality. And, and I get that. And it's not the whole answer, but it's a helpful part of the answer. And in, in many cases, I'm glad, too, that you mentioned the other thing that was all over that event in Boston, which was data mesh and data fabric. Oh, and I'm like, gracious. where did these come from and why am I supposed to care about them all uh, of a sudden? Well, <laughs> the, well the, 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 the short answer. Uh, well, there are a few shorter answers. One of them is you can blame my old employer. Uh, Gartner is pounding the data fabric drum pretty hard. And, and the more they pound the data fabric drum, the data mesh people want to hurt, want their drum to be heard. So there is this, th these growing factions of, of mesh and fabric and it's boom, me, no, me, you know, and it's like, okay. Um, there, there are merits certainly to, to both. Um, but they are inherently architectural patterns. Right. And I think the data mesh people are now listening to this is like, no, it's not. It's more than that. It's 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 an operating model. OK, but but it's a way of managing technology. And, and when we when we lead with architecture, when we lead with a technology pattern and we don't lead with business needs and we don't lead with requirements that that ends up undercutting everything we're trying to do. So, you know, it's no surprise that. Data fabric is a, is, is, according to Gartner, is a top trend in, in, in the data management space because Gartner is talking about it over and over and over again with their clients. And then their clients go talk to other clients mm -hmm. and there are other clients and other companies and then it becomes a thing. So there's a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy there. Um, but but I, I would invite all the data leaders that are listening to this. Um, I, don't, I don't have a horse in that game. Right. Mean, meaning meaning data fabric, I think, could be transformational. I, I, I love the idea of active metadata. I love the idea of using AI and ML and graph and other cool stuff to allow the data to start informing its own classification and its own use and doing so in a seamless, highly virtualized way. I love it. I love data mesh. I love the notion of centralized yeah. and decentralized and solving for both and allowing data products to exist at the point of consumption. I, I, I love them both. They sound they sound fantastic to me if we can get there. Um, but I would invite all the data leaders, just don't lead with the technology. Sit down with your business stakeholders mm -hmm. and ask, what can't you do today that you want to do today because of the limitation of data? Yes. They're not going to tell you about, well, I, don't, I, have an, I have a shortage of active metadata or, or, or I don't have a, a robust data virtualization platform. That's not what they're going to tell you. They're going to tell you, um, I like to know when my customers are traversing our lines of products so I can sell product A to customer B. You know, and that's what they're going to tell you. And maybe that will lead you to a mesh. Maybe that will lead you to a, a fabric. Um, but you'll get a lot farther and you'll get a lot more credibility and you'll get a lot more support if you're having conversations about business pains and not talking about how cool data meshes are. Oh, 100 percent. And and it reminds me too, like because this this ties to the data leader, the data literacy um, piece as well. It's as it's I think about early in my consulting career. I was doing a lot of data strategy work and a lot of like data governance uh, initiation types of things for for clients. And I had a, had a senior person at my consulting firm. He sat in on a talk that I gave just internally, trying to get people understanding what, what data governance was all about and, and how our data strategy practice was working and stuff. And he kind of he took talked to me afterwards. He's like, "So what?" 
And he just, he's like, why do I care? And he said it very bluntly and, and it stuck with me. And I'm like, but, and, and, and I like stumbled around it for a while and I never had a good answer. And it's like the data literacy, the data mesh, the data fabric. Like if we would just answer that, so what if like, the, if there's a reason they should care, then they'll learn it. They'll, they'll care. They'll do the things that are necessary. But if, if we're trying to sell them something that we care about, that we think is important, that is not relevant to them, they're going to know. Let's not pretend that yep. we understand their role and what they do as well as they do. Like we just don't. Yeah, so and, let's and recognize. The, yeah. the, the, the funny thing that I'm, it's not funny. It's kind of actually a little bit tragic. Um, I'm old enough to have survived big data, right? <laughs> and I, I'm old enough to remember when the answer to every question was Hadoop, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and it seems like we didn't learn much from that. I know a lot of companies that sank millions into deploying Hadoop clusters where what they ended up standing up and what they ended up doing was creating a lot of very, very, very interesting answers to questions that didn't exist. Right. Yes. I can answer yes. all sorts of things. I can I can I can show you where there's a correlation between eye color and length of employment tenure. Right. OK, that's that's cool. <laughs> um, but but is HR asking for that? You know, is is, is HR looking to, to hire more blue eyed people? Or is, I, I, I'm being very glib here. You, you, you get my point. Mm -hmm. Which is which is okay. Don't, don't go don't go building infrastructure in, in in the hopes that the business is going to ask those questions or have those needs. Uh, understand the needs first, and you, and 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 you'll get there. But um, you know, at at that conference and at other conversations and other conferences, I've I've have seen I've seen more of this kind of technology first, and and it just it, it's always a red it's always a red flag to me because I've seen organizations go way down the wrong mm -hmm. path. So, yeah, in interesting and impactful are two very different things. Like a lot of this stuff is really interesting. Yep. It doesn't necessarily move the needle on the stuff that actually matters. Um, and what does matter uh, for us right now is that in typical data leadership lessons uh, fashion, we are way over time. Uh, so we're going to have to cut it uh, there. Uh, before we go, Malcolm, what's the, what's the best way for folks to find you? LinkedIn. If you search for Malcolm Hawker. Uh, there's only three of us on the planet, I think. Um, my, there, my spelling, my first name is a little tricky. There's a second L, but if you search for Hawker, H-U-W-K-E-R, chances are, uh, you'll you'll know somebody that I know, and 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 that I'll I'll show up pretty quickly in LinkedIn. But yes, please, I would invite all of your listeners to connect with me on LinkedIn. If you've got questions about data management, about MDM, data quality, data strategy, anything that you would otherwise want to ask a Gartner analyst, you can ask me. Hit me up on LinkedIn. I, I, I'm happy to support. I've actually started implementing some regular office hours as well uh, through, through through Prophecy, which I'm 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 you know I, I'll advertise on on LinkedIn as well. So if you've got questions, it's my mission to help data leaders uh, become you know and build companies that are more data driven. So please reach out on LinkedIn. Malcolm, thank you so much for the awesome conversation and for being on the show today. Thanks so much, Anthony. It's a pleasure. <laughs>